talks because this is a very general discussion about the Earth's energy imbalance due to climate change. The prior talks have been excellent, but they've gone deeply into subjects. I'm going to be much broader. So first of all, to introduce this topic, you know, the, the energy that we get on Earth comes from a variety of sources, including incoming solar radiation. And that energy is subdivided by reflection, absorption in the atmosphere, and then insulation on the surface. We have energy transfers from the surface by evapotranspiration, latent heat. And finally, there are energy contributions with infrared energy exchanges with the atmosphere. All of that leaves us with this net absorption rate of about 0.9 watts per square meter, which is an incredibly huge number when you think about the surface area of the Earth. So I'm going to talk about that number, and I'm going to talk about how that's manifest in the different thermal reservoirs on our planet. First of all, I don't need to state the obvious, but this is one of the most, one of the most famous curves in all of science, let alone climate science. This is the Keeling curve, which is a measurement of carbon dioxide back to 1957. And there's a clear trend of increasing carbon dioxide with an annual variation. But it's not just carbon dioxide. This is a famous graph from the IPCC AR4 report. The three most important human emitted greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, all of them have experienced significant increases since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. So, What's the result? Well, this is data from NASA. This is uh, NASA GIST temp data going back to 1880. And I'm showing you the 10 hottest years on record back to 1880. And there are four or five different institutions that measure uh, Earth temperatures. They all agree within some, some variation uh, about this temperature trend. The temperature trend is clearly upwards. Now, 2014 currently is near the hottest ever, but my prediction is it ends up being around number three, about where that star is. So if you follow climate change in the media, you've probably heard that climate change stopped 15 years ago. Has anyone heard that? There's a hiatus. Why has climate change stopped? Well, what people are doing is they focused on this very recent period which started around 15 years ago, and they say, well, climate change hasn't increased much. Earth temperatures haven't increased. So I want to explore that, and I want to explore this common myth and misconception in the general uh, public and media. So how do we measure the energy imbalance? Well, we can measure it from space. We've got satellites up there that measure uh, incoming energy and outgoing energy. These are the so-called TOA, or top of atmosphere measurements. Those measurements are not absolutely accurate, but they are accurate, they are consistent enough that you can measure trends. We can also measure energy storage on Earth. That is how much energy appears in the big thermal reservoirs, in particular the ocean. But the challenge is how do you make adequate measurements to be accurate enough? And then finally, climate models, computerized climate models with specified forcings can give you information about Earth energy imbalance. So I'm going to talk about that middle one. Now, why is measurement such a critical issue? Well, where is that energy going? You know, that 0.9 watts per square meter, where does it end up? Over 90% of it goes into the ocean. This is a graph from a 2012 paper. And this is just a... Uh, uh, chart showing the relative contributions of the different thermal reservoirs. It's all going into the ocean, practically. So let's say that you're an oceanographer. This is one of the areas I work on, ocean temperature measurements. How do you measure the ocean? It's 70% of the Earth's surface. Not only do you need to measure the ocean, you have to measure the depth of the ocean. And large parts of the ocean are 5,000 meters deep. How do you do it? <clears throat> I'm going to skip this uh, slide. Let me, let me just see. I'm going to skip this slide for, for uh, brevity's sake. Well, one of the most exciting recent studies on measurement of ocean is 
the use of reanalysis uh, uh, products, in, in particular ORAS4, which is a real analysis based uh, system based on the European uh, ECMWF uh, weather model. And this reanalysis, I'm going to talk about what reanalysis is in a, in a moment, but it spans from 1958 to present time. And what reanalysis does is it fits a model with sparse data set. So you've got temperature measurements, uh, you've got maybe salinity measurements, you've got pressure measurements and so forth. And you couple those to a climate model and you continually feed information from measurements to the climate model. So you fill in gaps and you continually update the climate model. Among the instruments that are used for the reanalysis are XBT, which are, I'm going to give a talk tomorrow about how oceanography measurements are made. The entire talk will be about that, but I'll talk about XBTs, expandable bathy thermographs, uh, conductivity temperature, depth measurements, moorings, etc. A bunch of different measurement methods are all input into the climate models in the reanalysis process. And then you have to couple them with forcings and ERA-40 forcings were used and then interim forcings and then a different type of analysis since 2010. So you're stitching together different climate forcings over history. Uh, the best pa the paper which discusses this methodology is uh, published in 2013. Just to read right from the ECMWF website, and I hate to read from slides, but this is good. To make a forecast, you need to know the current state of the Earth's surface. The forecast produced use data assimilation to estimate local conditions. So you're, again, you're connecting meteorological observations with a climate model. And then you run them forward in time, and you continually feed in measurements to update the model. And of course, you're going to run these models as, as an ensemble to look at what the impact is on small perturbations in the initial conditions. How do those progress over time, manifest over, their over time? So what are some of the results? Well, this graph, which is taken from a 2013 paper, shows upper ocean heat content. Is there a yeah. clicker here? Those, those, those pens. Oh, these guys, these pens, wow. All right, this is, so the ocean is, approximately 5,000 meters deep. And the question is, where is this energy going? If you look at the very upper 300 meters, here is the ocean heat content since about 1955, 1958. And notice that there's been a flattening here. You see that over, since about 2003. The upper ocean, the upper 300 meters, has not been heating very much since about 2003. In fact, if we go down to 700 meters, Again, you see this flattening out. But if you go down the total depth of the ocean, you see that there's this dramatic and continued increase in ocean heat content. So how do I relate that to our so-called energy imbalance? These are the slopes that you would get in ocean heat content for 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 1 watt per square meter. So when you match up this slope with these, Gra uh, lines, you can estimate the energy imbalance of the Earth. One of the things you're, you're probably wondering about is why does ocean heat content take a dip? Well, it takes a dip when there's a large tropical volcanic eruption, which can cause temporary cooling of the Earth. Uh, when particulates are put into the uh, atmosphere, they reflect sunlight. And then this was uh, a very large El Nino that caused a short-term uh, decrease. So has global warming stopped? The folks who talk about global warming stopped have, have looked at this part of the curve and they've said, hey, the, the curve isn't increasing very much, therefore climate change stopped in 2004, uh, 2003, but they've neglected the deeper parts of the ocean. And if I can compare the reanalysis with Real data, this is from NOAA, Leviticus, or Levitus uh, 2012. The black line is the real data, and the purple line is the reconstructed data. And in fact, this is data up through uh, March of this year. This is ocean heat content down through 2,000 meters. And again, 
When you look at the full, a, a deeper section of the ocean, you do not see a halt or cessation in uh, global warming. In fact, if anything, there's a recent uptick at the very end here. So here's that graph again. So what, it, what happens at the surface? Why have we seen that surface level off over the past few years? It turns out a combination of volcano, volcanoes and El Nino oscillations have caused the increase of atmospheric temperatures to level off slightly, but the ocean temperatures have increased. And when you remove those signals, when you remove ENSO and volcanoes, here are the perhaps the five world's most uh, recognized temperature measurements. And look at that. They increase without cessation or without halt. So on the left, this is ocean heat. On the right, these are atmospheric temperatures, surface temperatures. So why? Why has the heating of the upper 700 meters slowed down, but the heat's been buried deep in the ocean? It's a really good question that is the topic of many, many research studies right now. Let me tell you the current view. If we look at the passive, their, their natural cycles in the ocean atmosphere currents, one of them is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And the Pacific Decadal Oscillation uh, goes through these periods of being negative, positive, negative, positive, and now negative. And that Pacific Decadal Oscillation has an impact on ocean temperatures, especially in the Pacific. Especially in the Pacific. And look at this. This is a view of the global surface temperatures taking 1999 to 2012 and subtracting off 1976 to 1998. Most of the Earth has gotten warm, but look at what happened in the El Nino region. That has actually cooled off. It's cooled off. So why? Why is that region cooled off? Not only is the surface cooled off, but the subsurface right here, here, and here have cooled off. This is the upper... Uh, this thing is dying here. This, this is the upper 100 meters. This is the temperatures down to 700 meters, and then this is a full depth. But look, regardless of the depth, the Pacific, parts of the Pacific have gotten colder, but parts of them have gotten warmer. Why? Can we explain that phenomenon? Well, we think we can. We think the phenomenon is associated with changes to Pacific winds. So trade winds. Winds along the equator, which push, have, have strengthened. And they're pushing water westward. What does that do? That creates a more prevalent La Nina situation. So you're pulling water from South America toward Australia. And you create a cold water upwelling along the coast of South America. And a warming pooling near Australia. So again. That's, this is the pattern on the right, and those are the winds. I'm going to skip this. We can actually see this. Someone earlier today asked a question about why sea level rise isn't uniform. Well, here's a great example. This is sea level rise subtracting off the global rise of three millimeters per year. So we're going to start with a zero baseline. And we see that near Australia, China, the Philippines, we have more sea level rise than normal. And here, we have less sea level rise than normal. So this is falling relative to that. And that's because the wind is dragging Pacific waters westward. But if we look at the globe, there has been no halt of sea level rise. So on average, sea level rise is, uh, sea levels rise in about three millimeters per year. But you get these re regional variations. So where does that leave us? Well, we can project forward in time. And we can now 
adjust our climate models to take into account those strengthening Pacific winds. And what we see is that if the winds persist, there will be a slight reduction in the overall global temperature rise, but it's, it's temporary. And in fact, in one of the models, they've kept the Pacific winds on until about 2010, uh, 2015, and then they let them relax. So we don't know if these stronger Pacific winds are going to continue, but we can include their impact in global climate models. This uh, graph is a paper 2014 by Matthew England. And of course, if we look at decadal warming, uh, which is the better measurement, you know, long-term warming, we don't want to compare one year to another. There's been a consistent and continued increase, and we're going to see that. It's not going to stop. And we don't want to confuse a myth of cooling by picking a hot year and then a cold year with the reality of long-term temperature increases. And I think that does it for me. So I'd be happy to take any questions that people may have. Thank you. Uh, so any question? <laughs> we need the mic first. So, uh, and by the way, thank you, everyone. I thought I was going to have to buy everyone a beer just to keep you here for the last talk, but I'm happy I didn't have to do that. Thank you very much. My question is, um, well, considering where you took your measurement, especially the radiation uh, that comes with the first picture you showed and you gave us the net of 0 0.9 watts per meter squared, yeah. I, I want to ask, did you consider, uh, compare these results with other regions like the tropical area, the African, you know, if you go to different regions, you, you, have, you will definitely have the uh, radiation measurement differently. Yes, um, this, this is global, and in fact, depending on how you do the measurements, you'll get a different answer. You'll get very, basically, depending on the researcher, you'll get from 0.5 to 1 watt per square meter. But there are regional variations, and let me give you an example. There's the so-called brown cloud of Asia, which is actually visible by satellite. It's due to in, uh, incomplete burnt biomass uh, in, in Asia, India, and China principally. That cloud has affected surface radiation regionally. So, so you can get variations regionally for one reason or another, but of course, this is just global. My question, the second question is, the measurement of the temperature in the deep sea yes. that, you that you took, did you take that, I mean, is it from this area or from, you took it around the continents? Yes. Are you referring to a particular um, part of the ocean? Is it Adriatic, Pacific, Atlantic, or which one? No, that's a really good question. It is global, and I'm going to actually pull up, I'll, pull, I'll show you a map of it. I've got my talk tomorrow. Um, uh, I think I've got an image here, right here. So depending on the year, this is, this is the measurement density, 1934, 1960, 1985, and 2009. And in fact, you can break them down by shallow water measurements and deep water measurements. Around 2003 to 2005, the Argo float system was installed, which is around 3,000 devices, which are spread approximately equally around the Earth's oceans. They go down to 2,000 meters and then come up autonomously, and they to use telemetry to send their data. So it's global, and it's pretty much down to 2,000 meters. But it is global. Great talk, John. Thank you so much. So I have a, a comment and, and a question. Um, the comment is when we tend to look at short-term trends, such as last winter's so-called polar vortex, we had politicians and commentators like Steve Forbes, who ran for president, several years ago uh, on Fox 25 News, uh, commenting that uh, global warming is done, it's over, the emperor has no clothes. So I think there's a danger in uh, media and p politicians looking at short-term trends or using the statistics to um, come up with positions in their favor, which can then unfortunately in influence policy uh, in a negative way. The question I have is I assume that that uh, decrease in upper and mid level ocean heat balance was in 1992 was due to Mount Pinatubo, is that 
um, correct? Yes, that's right. I will pull up that. Uh, I'll pull up that image. All right, and also, um, do you think then could a trend in reversal of uh, mid to upper level oceanic heat balance be used as a predictive tool for increased periods of volcanic activity that may be ahead, or does it lag significantly? Uh, well, it, it lags slightly. Um, so when you have uh, certain volcano, volcanoes can eject particulates very high in the atmosphere, which reflects sunlight for about three to four to maybe five years. And we can detect that in surface temperatures and in ocean temperatures. Um, I don't know if it's a predictive tool, but certainly you can see it after the fact. But what is re what's an emerging area of research is what about small volcanoes that are erupting? And Ben Sancher at, uh, is he at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, came out with a paper about a year ago on the impact of small volcanoes. Here we see a huge volcano. I mean, 1992, that's Pinatubo, and we've got El Chacon and Agung. Those guys we see clearly, but what about the small ones? That's the area of research that's very active right now. But as a predictive tool, I think that's hard. Hello. Uh, I can hear you. I, I can hear you in the microphone, and I think they want to use it for recording. Okay, sorry. Uh, I have two quick questions. Question number one. Is there any toil, is there a reason why the slopes are different between the 300, 700, and the, and the deep parts of the ocean? Yeah, the reason why their slopes are different is because this, this is how much heat's in the top 100 meters. This is how much heat goes into the top 700. And then, so this gap right here is the heat going into the 700 to 2,000 range. This gap is how much heat goes from 700 to 100 range. Yep. Yeah, I know, but uh, is there an explanation for this? Because if you look at the late 90s, uh, the 700 goes down, the uh, 300 goes down, but, the, deep, but the, the deepest part is kind of stable, kind of constant. Yeah. And then lately, it's the other way around. Yeah, OK, that's a great question. And you know, getting three questions makes me think that either people love my talk or more likely I didn't do a very good job. So I really uh, com commend you on these excellent questions. Actually, I love it. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. So remember I talked about those increasing winds, which are recent observations? What those winds do is they churn over the ocean waters. They pull up cold water from deep below near South America, and they push it against Australia. And what that does is increase energy transfer downwards. So the increasing easterlies have resulted in an increase of heat going below. But here's the catch. When those easterlies subside, we expect this trend to reverse so that we'll get a jump in heat in the upper levels. So these, this, these differences in slope are connected to the winds in the Pacific. And we have to see how they evolve, but, but, but there is certainly a different rate of energy storage at the different levels, depending on what's happening in the atmosphere. These things are connected, and that's one of the takeaway messages. OK, my second question. Uh, you showed a map where you normalized the sea level by the millimeters. The, I mean, you did minus A for all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and then you see difference uh, between uh, the ocean areas are different places, right? Uh, the, uh, my question is, why did you just uh, removed only three millimeters? Is it an ever three millimeters? Is it the average to make to normalize? The reason, yeah, the reason in, in this 2013 paper, three millimeters per year was removed because it's the global average. So you can think about this as an anomaly with respect to the global average. Anything in blue is rising less than the global average. Anything in yellow, orange, or red are rising faster than the global average. So for example, here, you're getting 9 millimeters per year plus 3. Yeah, yeah I, I get Does that it. make yeah. sense? Yeah, it's kind of okay. normalized it, right? Yeah, it's a normalization. Thank you. I think one last question, I think. I, look, I will stay around and, and take questions afterwards, but we'll do one last one. I have a 
something that is you told that brown clouds yes asian brown clouds because this is uh, basically it's not that uh, carbon suit and all those things it is from the desert actually it's a ferruginous uh, it is not that happened only now it's happened for the 100 to 200 years uh, it's reported there so but uh, you mentioned that that changes are due to that uh, brown clouds that i i don't know that is why okay. it is uh, you are linked to that brown clouds asian brown cloud and another one is that uh, uh, what is the role of uh, oceanic current because uh, when it goes to 700 meters the ocean currents play a major role than the what you are talking about the easterlies and all those things yeah okay good question um First of all, with respect to brown clouds, I brought them up as a, an example of why you wouldn't get uniform changes to solar radiation globally. Uh, there was a question about how things might differ in, let's say, Nigeria, for example. You may get changes due to changing cloudiness, changing um, uh, 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 opaqueness of the atmosphere, which is why I brought up brown clouds. But thank you for pointing out and correcting me about the source of brown clouds. That's, that's excellent. It's certainly not my area of expertise. Absolutely, ocean currents matter. Um, but the, the evolving studies about the change in atmospheric currents in the Pacific is, is thought to be what's driving this change in particular. And it's important, this change in particular is important because this is what's driving heat down. So I'm not discounting oceanic currents, but I'm just tying, I'm tying the change to those slopes in different uh, heat, ocean heat contents at different levels, to this change in particular, which is driven by, by, um, by atmospheric currents. But of course, these things are coupled and connected. So, you know, I'm taking a scalpel and I'm saying this is due to atmosphere, but really they're all connected. So thank you for that, allowing me to clarify. Thank you so okay. much. I had a great time. Thank you. Thanks to you.